we shall continue to discuss uh, the chapter on stress corrosion cracking. In the last class, uh, I started giving uh, the historical perspective of um, stress corrosion cracking and then we also highlighted the importance of the stress corrosion cracking for the industrial uh, component safety, how it can uh, impact the safety of the components. And then we looked at the characteristics of uh, stress corrosion cracking especially uh, in terms of the cracking behavior. And uh, about the characteristics we said that uh, these cracks are brittle in nature as compared to uh, ductile failures happen in metals uh, due to mechanical loading. And uh, these brittle fractures can be intragranular type or it can be a transgranular type of uh, cracking. Of course, sometimes you can also have a mixed mode of failures, it, you know, partly intragranular and partly transgranular cracking can really happen. In all these cases, they are brittle and uh, mostly uh, cleavage kind of uh, cracking. They, 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 uh, they appear. So, continuing on the same direction, the next important thing that you would like to know is um, what are the factors affecting stress corrosion cracking. If you recall, I have given you uh, the Venn diagram, right, wherein we discussed what is stress corrosion cracking. This is SCC, the phenomena that happens. And the factors involved are the metal or the material, the environment, the third or the tensile stresses. So, if you need to understand what are the governing factors, we need to understand in relation to the metals, the metallurgy of the material that is used for a given application. The environment that uh, the material will be exposed to and the nature of the tensile stresses. So, all these are going to govern the, uh, the susceptibility of a material towards stress corrosion cracking. And uh, if you start with, let us start with the, the tensile stress. Please notice that we are not talking about a fatigue or not talking about uh, a compressive, we do not talk about the torsion right, we talk about the tensile stresses. The tensile stresses acting on the material uh, can be classified into two categories, one it is applied, the other residual stresses right. The applied stresses are you know a process specific right, what kind of load you are applying externally 
in a chemical reactor you know it can come out of the pressure of the reactants and products involved ok. And the result stresses they reside in the material because of let us say the welded component you weld it and the weld zone as you could have a tensile component and somewhere in the weld component you can also have a compressive component you have. So, there is a the residual stresses acting even you remove all the external loading or stresses onto a component ok. It could be a cold war you have done a wire drawing you have done you have done some kind of uh, sheet metal you know formed by rolling operations. It can be thermal can be the thermal stresses acting on the material or it can also be related to corrosion product accumulation. the system right. The corrosion product accumulation can come uh, depending upon the situation. I give a, a illustration you guys have some exposure to heat exchangers we have seen right. In heat exchanger uh, you would have tube and a tube sheet. you weld it right you weld you weld it or sometimes an expansion joint actually you know mostly it is an expansion joint right you expand it. And sometimes you know you weld on one side you know normally they weld you know where it is facing outside they weld it and this side is not welded right. Assume what happens the liquid goes inside the liquid goes inside ok the environment penetrate what can happen for example, you have iron iron can convert into what it can convert into various corrosion product one of the product could be iron hydroxide can form right. The volume of the iron hydroxide is is more than the volume of the iron that is corroded right. So, volume increase. volume increase right. Now, there is a corrosion products here and uh, volume increases what will happen to this tube? The tube will will dent right it could be dent it can happen a dent. Stresses will start acting on that ok. It can be very high tensile stresses. Now, these stresses can add to the applied stresses you can add to the applied stresses. So, when you consider the material against uh, you know stress corrosion cracking you need to take care of both the applied stresses and the, the residual stresses acting on the structure. Now, there is a, a kind of uh, I would say concept I will say concept called as threshold stress. Below which stress corrosion cracking does not occur. called sigma t h there is a symbol sigma t s for that. This arises out of the fact that if you carry out a test in the lab
attempt to fail versus the applied stresses right you apply a stress um, you can conduct a simple test right I, I can take a a tensile sample and I enclose it in, you know the cell I can take the environment here I can apply apply stress on the sample right this is the environment here and uh, I can find out the time to failure a simple test ok you can do and if you notice that something like that you know you get like this. When I apply a stress it fails instantaneously right what should be the stress at which the metal component fails a metal fails instantaneously what is this called factor stress or what you call in our term it is called as it is called as ultimate central stress right. But if you lower the stress level in an environment the time to failure increases right is not it as you lower the stress the time to failure uh, increases and there is a there is a limit ok and there is a limit and this is called as threshold stress below which metal is not failing. Now, this is uh, used in some cases you know lay especially in in, uh, in oil and gas industries. They use this concept of that ok, but you notice that the threshold stress that we talk about is time dependent. Right? What do you mean by that? Suppose you you know here it starts failing, so you know that here it does not fail. What is the time you wait for, right? So generally the time is say a thousand hours or seven twenty hours if you wait for more it may start failing ok. So, this is not an ideal parameter, but it is used as the engineering parameter uh, to determine um, the uh, you know applicability of a particular material especially in the oil and gas industries. We will come back to this later right and this concept is not used in the in the nuclear industries ok and again I will talk about it um, later why it is not used in the nuclear industries, but nevertheless the literature has uh, you know you see lots of uh, materials uh, you know people give this as a property. Um, of course, it depends upon the environment you keep changing environment the sigma threshold could change it is not a material property alone it is also an environmental property ok uh, that I think you should uh, you should be aware of that. Now, you know for example, I would say this is your 304, 316 and maybe 310 something like that you know we can see that it can change if you are going to use a duplex in the steel uh, things can still go up and uh, the threshold stress intensity uh, sorry the threshold stress uh, does not um, I mean uh, remain constant for all the materials it can change. Now, this uh, uh, this particular thing is, um, is is very important to understand from the concept of what happens in the stress corrosion cracking. Suppose, I apply a component and for a you know an industry application, how does stress corrosion cracking really work actually 
let us look at the time with the time what things are happening what do really happen with the time right. This is the time and this is you can say extension. You take a material and uh, you apply a load uh, you know and then uh, expose it to the environment and you observe you will see that uh, you know the extension does not happen long time. Have to take place ok. At a, at a, at a given load uh, at a given at a given stress applied stress. So, the curve change if the, if the load is uh, if the stress is uh, you know increasing or decreasing uh, it, it could move left and right kind of thing right. If you look at here, what happens is you see generally if the 90 percent of the time, generally 90 percent of the time for initiation for crack initiation. So, this is where the crack initiates huh? and this is where the crack propagates. And this crack initiation is a very interesting thing ok. This initiation time the initiation here involves it could be a pitting assisted, pitting corrosion assisted one, it could be a crevice corrosion assisted or intragranular corrosion assisted one, it could be selective leaching. They are all can be they are called as a precursors and they are involved in the processes. A pit turns into a crack, an intragranular corrosion turns into a crack into an intragranular stress corrosion cracking right. A crevice attack can lead to stress corrosion cracking within the crevice can happen. Sired leaching also can happen. So, these are the factors can assist stress corrosion cracking and since these are relatively slow processes and quite a bit of time is involved in the crack initiation. So, when you talk about stress corrosion cracking control you should also understand that you can control it by controlling the pitting corrosion, controlling crevice corrosion intergranular corrosion, side releasing all these stuffs. Of course, the metal can leak just with pitting only, it need not be a CC you know. Crevice corrosion can be standalone failure can happen, but if they are loaded and if the stress levels are beyond the threshold stress levels, yes they can undergo stress corrosion cracking at late later time. So, this is a, 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 a very important and, and a very interesting thing when you talk about materials development and materials design actually. The other thing that you would like to notice is that please notice that the crack initiate and grows and finally, it is a rupture right and this rupture is is a mechanical failure. Failure of the remaining portion of the specimen or a component right. Suppose, I have taken let us say about 1 centimeter thick component, it is possible that stress corrosion crack exists up to 70 percent of the thickness 
remaining 30 percent of thickness it fails by overload. I come to the point later ok. So, it is not necessary that the entire sample the entire component fails by stress corrosion cracking. This is very important because when you talk about investigation when you take a failed component you would not see completely intergranular cracking or transgranular cracking you will see yes there are brittle cracks, but you also see some part of the sample having a ductile fracture. The ductile fracture is coming out of the fact that it is a overload failure. The crack advances right it means the crack advances and then it leads to it leads to finally, overload failure you know. So, you look at this here right what is this actually this one leads to ultimate tensile strength right yes if you if you if you lower the cross section you keep the same applied load the stress increases and ultimately that comp that particular segment leads to a mechanical failure ok can happen in practice and it indeed happens in in most cases actually ok. Now, that means, uh, that means the two types of uh, the two types of two types of uh, design people talk about the design that takes into account crack initiation and the design that takes into account crack propagation. right. So, what do you mean by a design that takes into account crack initiation? I simply do not accept even a small crack in the component because the metal is considered to be brittle and a small crack is there and is going to fracture. So, there is a problem right there is a problem. So, the design that takes care of uh, crack uh, you know initiation account they use the threshold stress as a concept right. But those design which takes care of the crack propagation they use the fraction mechanics as a concept. As a criteria for that right. So, that is what they use it. Now, so let us look at how the crack propagates again I am not going to uh, deal with the fraction mechanics you know in details, but a bit of uh, exposure to that uh, is useful uh, to see how stress corrosion cracking can affect the crack growth in any given component right. So, if if I you know what is uh, you know what is called as stress intensity factor. Okay. What is stress intensity? A, you know, and you of course have a different modes of uh, uh, you know uh, loading that you have, and mode one of loading, okay, k k one is given by what? Given by y sigma and square root of pi a right. You might have again uh, you know again uh, studied in maybe in other courses ok. And uh, a 1 corresponds to crack tip stress intensity and uh, sigma corresponds to applied tensile stress and A corresponds to crack length and Y is a complex factor anybody likes it depends upon the geometrical factors ok. It depends upon the geometrical you see it is a geometrical parameter 
So, we are not getting into two details about it, but it is you know it is I think it is sufficient for us to get a feel for uh, stress corrosion cracking and crack growth in a given material. Now, it is it is now look at here depends upon the the applied stress and uh, it depends upon the length of the crack is related to uh, k 1 value right. Now, you know very well that there is something called as k 1 c what is this called anybody yeah it is toughness it is a material parameter right below which a crack does not grow. fracture toughness right critical stress intensity factor or the fracture toughness ok and uh, and below which the crack does not really propagate. If I carry out a test uh, to measure the crack growth rate versus crack stress intensity ok. So, if I plot A is the length of the crank and so d A by d T corresponds to crack growth rate and versus the uh, crack tip uh, stress intensity if I do that in a given environment of course, you will see that it goes like that. This is called as stage 1 CAG growth rate, it is called as stage 2 crack growth rate and this is stage 3 crack, crack growth rate. What is special about it? What is special about it? The stage 1 and stage 2 the crack growth rates depend upon the crack tip stress intensity whereas, the stage 2 does not depend on the crack tip stress intensity rather it depends on what. So, the stage 2 that k 1 um, no d a by d t um, in stage 1 and stage stage 3 depend upon and so on applied stress intensity or crack tip stress intensity. Stage 2 depends on the nature of the environment. and not on CAC tip stress intensity factor. Again there are lot of uh, you know understanding there uh, we will not uh, get uh, more details about this um, you know those who really we want to do uh, there are good papers available and uh, so we will not right now get into that discussion. Now, let us look at the uh, the plot and this corresponds to what? This corresponds to k 1 c and this corresponds to k 1 s c c ok. What is k 1 s c c? k 
threshold stress intensity factor for stress corrosion cracking. Please notice that if we have environment, if you look at this plot, if we have environment, the crack can grow at a much lower test intensity level, right? Much lower than K1C, right? The K1C is here, it goes much lower than that. And in fact, this is they call as subcritical crack growth, right? And uh, you know, so in the in the interest of environment, you can have subcritical crack growth uh, taking place in the material. That's a disadvantage of the environment, actually. Okay, that is something is um, used to be used to be regarded. So the people use these five factors, and also people use this is this is another factor, and this is also please look at this. Here the crack growth rate now does not depend upon stress intensity, and this also is used as an engineering parameter. To design the life of the component. So, K1 SEC and stage 2 crack growth rate. In fact, there are designs just takes care of or, 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 or uses only the stage 2 crack growth rate. They do not worry about all other things because if I know what crack growth below K1C, you are not supposed to have any crack growth rate at all. Why is that the crack is growing here? Because of the environment, ok. Here, of course, you have a, com a combination of uh, quite a bit of stress intensity and the environment, but the role of environment here is much more here because see, there are two things happening the stress intensity drives the crack, first of all the environment drives the crack more. When you lower the stress intensity, the driving force where crack growth is, is decreased or increased. When you lower the stress intensity of the crack type, the driving force for the crack is decreasing or increasing? Decreasing, decreasing right. So, it is de so if you move over like this, the driving force for the crack is decreasing, crack to grow is decreasing. But, but what keeps up? The environment keeps up, the environment is making the crack to grow. If there is no environment in this case, the crack growth rate has to be almost the crack is not supposed to grow at all actually right, it is not supposed to grow at all. So, that is that is that is that is the meaning of this particular plot. How, uh, how it will be uh, without the environment actually? In fact, without the environment it will start from here only right, it does not start from here, it will, it will start somewhere here only, it will go from here start going here, is not it? Without the environment, the guy will start here only. In fact, this whole thing will not come into picture. It will, it will start going right here. Above K 1 C only, the crack will start even growing or it does not even grow. The crack is there, but it does not does not grow if it is less than K 1 C, if there is no environment. So, the crack will start, you know, you will see, it's in fact, it will go like this only. It will go like this or like this depends upon uh, tough, you know, other things now, ok, but you start from here only. Yes, did I answer the question? Ok. The other parameter uh, that also uh, counts uh, the stress corrosion cracking in general of, of material is, is the ductility. The measured ductility, um, especially uh, on in a slow strain rate machines, in a slow strain rate, I am not discussing right now strain rate test. They use a concept called a loss in, in ductility. Please again notice all this again time dependent parameters, you know. If you are going to do the experiment at a very low rate, very slow pulling, 
then the ductility might even decrease quite significantly. So, it is it's again SCC is a time dependent process much like creep. The thing is creep occurs at higher temperature, but here this occurs at the it can occur at the ambient temperatures. It is very similar to the creep process ok and but happening at the ambient temperatures. SCC can occur at higher temperatures I am not confining this to that. What I am trying to see an analogy of SCC versus creep it is somewhat similar to creep which means they are all time dependent phenomena we should take into account ok. So, we 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 are so we had some idea about so that means when we have this then people use a term what is called as SCC susceptibility index the term that is used and you might have uh, if attended other course uh, as I might have discussed in, in, in details. is given as um, a parameter measured in air minus parameter measured in environment. upon the parameter measured in in air. This parameter can be anything you know it could be ultimate tensile strength measured there. It can be uh, elongation reduction in area and it could be and it can be uh, if you want to call it yeah you can call it as um, K 1 S C C versus K 1 C. Yeah, it is it is a uh, K 1 C it is, in, it is in air right this is in air this is in the environment measured here. So, that is about the, the role of uh, tensile stresses and how the material is going to behave um, in terms of the uh, you know these mechanical parameters in, in, in presence of the environment uh, we saw this uh, you know briefly um, what uh, uh, yeah from the fracture pitch feature of that also we if you if you can recollect the we said yes this is brittle you know um, and we also said that you know in 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 a, in a failed sample in in SEC whether you do it in a laboratory test or in the field you also have a ductile fracture component in the specimen ok. That is happening because you know see let us look at like this. Suppose this is a notch sample right not in a sample notch and I have the environment here and apply that uh, the applied uh, stress is constant we keep it like that, but as the crack propagates what happens the stress increases right the stress the actual stress increases on the load bearing member of the specimen right. And uh, as it moves then what happens stress can be equal to it could be K 1 C in this case in a smooth sample it can be U T S value and so the metal can fail in a ductile manner. So, the last ligament that fails would have a, a ductile component 
in the in the material actually you can see that. The next uh, important thing that we should talk about is the environment. When you say environment, uh, you know, there is all some kind of general, uh, you know, feeling that it is specific to en environment. It is generally that kind of, uh, you know, the concept prevails and uh, say, uh, you know, to give an example, uh, stainless steel. take that it could fail in the chloride medium ok. In carbon steel it could be nitrates, carbonates like that you know nitrates, carbonates and even phosphates. So, what I am giving is just illustration uh, not an exhaustive list ok. And you are talking about let us say uh, copper based alloys. Say the ammonia ammonia solution is a problem. Similarly, when you talk about uh, uh, in aluminum and magnesium chloride medium ok. So, there are you know some kind of uh, you know they are all experimental observations right, but it appears that SCC need not be confined to a specific environment. The list of environments they keep adding with the time ok. In fact, uh, you know in the nuclear industry you, you know that SCC is observed in stainless steels in pure water. The water quality that they use in nuclear industries is ex, you know extremely very high quality. Even then stress corrosion cracking occurs. But then the time taken for SEC to occur is more, but the pure water can induce stress corrosion cracking on stainless steels at the temperatures at that pressure and over a long period. So, the specific environment though people overall talk about it uh, you know uh, if you are going to be more technical I think uh, this may not be totally correct ok. It can happen in many kinds of environments. But nevertheless environments play a significant role in terms of the life actually you know. What are these environments you say one chemical composition of the environment right say chloride sulfates and phosphates all these stuffs to the pH of the environment. Third the temperature So, given a broad picture right and broadly you can you can say this uh, chemical composition and uh, pH and the temperature they can influence the stress corrosion cracking susceptibility of the metals. Now, when you look at this broadly speaking again let us let us look at you know our understanding of stress corrosion cracking. Right now I am not going to get into mechanisms ok. Let us look at the our understanding of the stress corrosion cracking.
Now, when I apply a stress tensile stress you have a crack a pre crack is formed here. The crack grows perpendicular to the applied stress right. The crack grows perpendicular to the stress axis stress axis it is perpendicular to the stress axis it is it, it, it just propagates you know it grows. When you have an environment the crack has to grow the crack type. If the crack grows for example, if the crack grows in sideways like that sideways like this the stress has to be concentrated at the crack type. Assume that there is a huge dissolution here right assume there is a huge dissolution high dissolution. the crack front the dissolution rate of the metal is very high. So, what will happen? What do you think will happen? I magnify this and here the huge uniform corrosion right. It corrodes so much what will happen there? The crackable blunt crack is no more sharp blunt stress concentration could be significantly reduced from that. So, what it means for stress corrosion to cracking to occur So, for stress corrosion cracking to occur the crack walls need to be passivated the film has to be there. So, that only the crack tip the corrosion occurs the crack starts propagating along the directions otherwise the SCC will not occur assume that I am going to use very strongly corroding acid the SCC will not occur. So, the one criteria is that the metals must passivate. If they do not passivate, they do not undergo stress corrosion cracking. The film has to be there in the surface. And say when you take a passivation, right? When you take a passivation, passivity depends on what? You guys already studied, right? It depends on what? It depends upon it depends on the environment, it depends upon the potential and depends upon the pH. And what is this diagram called? The Pupil diagram forms certain kind of broad you know uh, indication where the stress corrosion cracking can occur for metals. So, when we when we said that the the the, the nitrates, the carbonates and phosphates when you talk about it they are the ones the passivate the carbon steel and so, they are the ones they also promote stress corrosion cracking. If there are no applied stresses I mean they will be very happy the corrosion rate may be very small ok and because there are tensile stresses the stress corrosion cracking occurs right ok. So, the passivity is a, a very important one is the passivity is a very important one yes, but then if you look at. So, then I want to draw this now say it is your uh, potential the pH something like that I think I hope you know this is for ion diagram right it is for ion in water. So, you have carbonates and bicarbonates right and bicarbonates 
you have nitrates and you have phosphates. So, these are the ones they they phosphates that means what, what does it mean when you take a steel and have water and put a carbonate bicarbonate the potential of that solution automatically goes to this particular place and start passivating and to phosphates it goes here in phosphates put a nitrate it goes here. So, th these environments maintain certain pH in the potentials and so these are the places where you get stress corrosion cracking happening in, in these steels. People also have shown that in a polarization diagram, SEC region right. It is a polarization diagram you see this they also found that stress corrosion cracking occurs very close to the pitting potential and very close to the active passive potential. These two potential region they are happening. So, so, what do you imply from this? What do you imply from this? Passivity is important, but if it is going to so absolute passivity, there will be no stress corrosion cracking. The passive, so it has to be an unstable passivity or something will should disturb the passivity. Okay, so so the passivity disruption has to be there. So, you take a stainless steel what does chloride do? The chloride disrupts what does oxygen do? Oxygen will take the potential towards a higher noble potentials right. You have chloride you have oxygen both of them they become they make the passive film. unstable. You can see that you know there are pits and the pits they become the place of the crack initiation the pitting occurs. So, the chlorides they do help to damage the film and then and when you form a pit they become stress risers and lead to stress corrosion cracking. Uh, you know we discussed earlier that stress corrosion cracking involves initiation right and the initiation process involves we say pitting is one of the precursor event you see the pits they are responsible for stress corrosion cracking it can happen and, um, and so they are they are they are the problems. If this is the case they found a very nice relationship between stress corrosion cracking and the oxygen content they call dissolved oxygen versus the chloride level SCC no SCC this we are talking about stainless steels in thermal and in nuclear power plants.
So, when you use so what how, how, how do they how do they generate power? They use water, they create steam, the steam is used to run the turbine. So, the water should contain as low as chloride and the oxygen content. So, that they do not undergo stress corrosion cracking, it is very critical, ok. And uh, you will see that the oxygen content is in the, in the PPB levels, ok. The chloride also is very, very untraceable levels of chlorides, ok. So, these are uh, very important things when you talk about the, the material stability is, is uh, you know in, in, in SEC. Similarly, you also see this in the cooling waters. systems the heat exchangers at the uh, at the ambient temperature see these these temperatures are what these temperatures are all around about 200 to 280 degrees celsius huh? very high temperatures ok. In cooling water systems the temperatures are all in the range of what in the range of 35 to about 50 degrees celsius and the cool you know cooling water is used you normally use the drinking water the chloride content there may be 100 ppm. 200 ppm are going to be there, but then if you are going to use chlorides and then what happens the stainless steels become prone to when I say stainless steel I mean arsenic. Please make this change uh, arsenic stainless steels become uh, susceptible to SCC above 50 degree Celsius. The other example uh, I just give and then move on because you know there's several kind of uh, uh, you know cases we can discuss. It's illustration. when it comes to caustic and, um, and how it can promote a stress corrosion cracking. Temperature hmm, carbon steel no stress relief required. And the carbon steel wells huh? wells or whatever ok stress need to be relieved or or use stainless steels. Here only nickel base alloys. So, put it in a in simple terms it is um, necessary for us to understand the environment you know before we talk about what will be the right material. When I say environment I would mean the pH, chemical species, temperature all the stuffs ok are to be known. So, that you make a right material selection. Going back we talked about let us say uh, you know cooling water right. The cooling water the temperature goes if the temperature is going to be greater than 50 degree Celsius how do the people tackle the tackle using du plus grade stainless steel. So, use that ok. So, you could find a solution right where you cannot use it you, you what do you do you bring down the intensity of the environment you know in boiler water you know 280 degree Celsius you cannot use du plus stainless steels. So, what happens you get it of chlorides you can get it of the uh, oxygen content. So, uh, you, you, you can have a 
C C. In the nuclear reactors what they do in fact they add even hydrogen. So, that the potential comes down because of the presence of hydrogen in the system. So, you can modify the environment also in order to bring down the stress corrosion cracking tendency of the metals. Um, there are sometimes you get into a very uh, difficult situation in the material selection it happens in the some industries like a, a fertilizer industry for example. The fertilizer industry say in a in a heat exchanger you use ammonia on one side and the chloride on the other side of it right. How do I choose the material right? If I have a chloride then I can choose a copper based alloy it does not undergo stress corrosion cracking. If it is ammonia I would go for stainless steel because it is free from stress corrosion cracking in ammonia right. But I have streams on one side you know maybe in the tube let us say ammonia goes in and the shell side water goes in and water has got chloride. So, how do you do that ok. So, what people do in this case is they use bimetallic tubes. So, these are all tubes wherein you have two different metals bonded actually right. So, one surface you will have brass and inside you will have in the steel they are bonded and uh, so that kind of things are being used. So, what you are trying to look at is if you know the problem you can find an engineering solution to the problem right. So, this is an engineering solution to the problem right. So, you can overcome the issue without any problems actually at all ok and of course, they are expensive bimetallic tubes are expensive, but that is a solution that you have so that you can uh, overcome the problem of stress corrosion cracking in the fertilizer industries ok. Are these bimetallics bonded uh, together? Yeah, they just uh, yeah they bonded huh? you, you can do whatever I mean it depends upon how the stream looks like right. You can have copper outside as steel inside depending upon of course, the technology that is available ok you can do that, but they are simply bimetallic tubes right. What does it mean? No, it's what it is, right? This may be your stainless steel, this may be your copper base alloy. Yeah, it will go inside. This is one fluid here, fluid one. Here is the fluid two. And so, what happens in this case I will send the ammonia outside right and the chloride containing one inside. So, I do not have any stress corrosion cracking issue at all. Any questions so far? Let me go to the next subject which is in that is the metallurgy of that ok. It of course, again is very <laughs> difficult to cover a huge amount of things here ok. And I will just give a very broad outlook and uh, no, because the metallurgy that you deal with stainless steel is different from than one you, you deal with aluminum alloys and with copper alloys. So, everything goes ok. So, let us uh, make a very broad uh, discussion. So, that you get a feel for what we mean by the metallurgy in relations to the stress corrosion cracking. It could mean the alloy chemistry it could mean the crystal structure
माइक्रोस्ट्रक्चर When you say microstructure, it means the the nature of phases, nature and morphology of the phases. The types of dislocation in the, in the system. grain size and the nature of the grains so they all can happen let me start with the alloy chemistry one example i'll give to do that and i would take uh, here the austenitic stainless steel or stainless steel i call it and uh, it is stress corrosion cracking in chloride environment time to failure versus the percentage of the nickel content okay goes like that you know what is the nickel content of this Eight percent nickel, almost the one we use as a workhorse, right? Three o four as eight percent nickel, and it's the worst. Actually, it's it's very difficult to separate out alloy chemistry, crystal structure, microstructure, dislocation. They're all intertwined. It's it's not possible to just to separate out. Actually, you know, not possible to do that because If I go and add nickel, and what happens? The crystal structure changes from BCC to FCC. If I take, if I add nickel, then what happens? You will see that the stacking fault energy decreases. So they are going to have different dislocation structure. So they are quite intertwined, but still, you can try to make, you know, um, you know, some component of, you know, what really happens, uh, you know, uh, to the FCC from that perspective, that point of view. Okay. Um, so the the chemistry of the the alloy can happen because you know at one point of time we said that the passivation is a very important one right if you are going to add a very high chromium content if it's going to make the passivation very very strong then the stress corrosion cracking can come down as well actually okay it is possible can happen you know from 304 to uh, 360 at the some cases this they do see marginal improvement in the stress corrosion cracking of the alloy they do see that thing okay i think we can continue um, in the in the next class